Really important to understand. Really important. Train a mule from their nose. And then once you do the ground communication kit and ground communication work, you take and use your uh, the Mule Riders Martingale. And the Mule Riders Martingale will start getting the mule bitted up to where he's more correct, more of what he needs to be, okay? And, uh, and that's kind of it in, in a nutshell. He basically said, I bought a trained mule, all right? If he's a trained mule in a 10-foot circle, you should be able to side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters. That's what you should be able to do, okay? Uh, and if you can't do that in a 10-foot circle, why take him on for a ride? Dave, should I hook up my, my internet cable? Yeah, we'll give it a try. See if that works here. Um, while Steve's doing that, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and hanging out with us. One thing that I did not think about is the time change. Now, out here in Arizona, we are the wild, wild west. And we are one of the lone areas in the entire United States that does not change clocks. And so I'm realizing now that your time didn't change because y'all rolled back your clock or rolled forward your clocks, I think, rolled forward your clocks, and we did not change it. So if you are just now watching this, just now coming in and be like, hey, oh, dang it, I missed it. You know what? Uh, I totally forgot about the time change. That just does not occur to us out here in Arizona because we never change our clocks. So we used to be on the same time zone as California last week, and this, this week we are back on the same time zone as Colorado. But we sure are glad that you're here hanging out with us, spending some time with us today. Um, as you are watching, whether you're live or on the replay, uh, we are would love to hear from you. So the first thing that we would ask is that you share your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather is like. Uh, I am watching from Gilbert, Arizona today. I'm about uh, probably about 40-minute drive from Steve. Steve's out there in Queen Valley. Uh, what's it like out there, Steve? Out here, it's like uh, I can't even see a cloud in the sky. It is blue as blue can be. It, that it is. And I think it's pretty close to 70 degrees right now. It's real nice. It's Y'all need to come out to Arizona and experience what uh, what uh, heaven on earth is meant to feel like. You see here, uh, life only gets better with Jesus, but it's pretty good here right now. And uh, if it only gets better, we are in store for a treat. So your name, where you're watching from, what the weather is like. The second thing we ask is that you share any and every mule or donkey question that you've got. We would love to know what it is you are working on, where you're trying to get results, and what it is you're trying to do. So ask any and every question you got, and we'll be sure to get to them. And then the third question we ask, or the third thing we ask, is that you share the broadcast. Now, if you're on YouTube, real easy to do that. On YouTube, there is a share button and there is a like button. Uh, in addition to clicking one or both of those, you can also click the subscribe button, and uh, and that is how you can show some love. And if you're over on Facebook, you can click the share button, share it to your feed, or you can tag a friend or family member. And that's the way you can share the love, let other people know what's going on, and uh, and get folks uh, get folks in here hanging out with us. Uh, Candy is watching in Indiana. She says time falls back. It's a beautiful day. Agreed on both accounts. Uh, next question we've got. This one came in from David. David says I have a mule about two years old. He has a vet diagnosed, uh, diagnosed uh, sarcoid between his hock and his knee on the front leg. Doesn't bother him much unless he bumps it and then it will bleed. It, I don't see, it doesn't seem to be growing over time. Any counsel on treating it? Um, David, what would you, what is a, uh, what is a uh, sarcoid and then any counsel on treating it, Steve? Okay, so a sarcoid is mostly on babies. Uh, like under three years old, it's usually around the muzzle and it's kind of, it almost looks like a cauliflower looking thing. And, uh, I've never seen one down below the neck, but around the knee, it's not unusual. Uh, a lot of your vets will, uh, will cut it off, uh, and then sear it. I usually just leave them go, you know, as long as there's not a problem, it's not causing a problem with, with the mule or with my training process, it's just part of being a baby. Um, and, and so it's nothing to worry about. All right. Very good. Uh, Steve, in the coming, uh, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing an event. We're going to be doing a live, uh, 
webinar on, I think it's uh, December 29th around 6 p.m. I've got the information here pulled up. I'll share it. We're going to be talking about training without a saddle and working on timing. Why don't you tell us a little bit about why we're doing that, why it's important this time of year? Well, this time of year, of course, we're usually riding less, um, but you still need to do a few things with your mule. And there are certain things that I'm going to talk to you about that really, um, you know, is kind of like keeping them tuned and, 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 uh, you kind of do a few things during the winter time, then come spring. We'll do another webinar on now it's spring. Now what do we do? I think it'd be a good idea, uh, Dave. And, but it's basically a lot of different things that you can do, uh, when the weather is cold and when you only have a few feet to work in, listen, you don't need a 50 foot round pin to keep tuned. Now this is not just for your meal. Keep this in your mind. This is for your tiny. Because every time you move your hands on the reins, you're communicating with your mule. As soon as you touch them reins, the mules go, oh, oh, what's he want? What, what's he, why is it over here? Okay. Now, we were talking earlier about the mule getting his tongue over top of the bit. And the last thing I want to say to, to which I talked to the guy yesterday, but when a tongue is up over top of the bit, you've got the bit too high. You always want to teach them to pack the bit. The bit is hanging down, bumping the front teeth. They need to reach down, pick it up, and carry it. They'll show you where it needs to be put. Now, on a snaffle bit on my mule riders martingale, I never ever move it. Never. They pick it up and pack it throughout their six months of training. The finished bit, it's going to hang down between the incisors and the corners of the mouth. And they're going to pick it up and hold it where they like it. You'll adjust it to that spot. You do not put on a pre-adjusted bit all the time. What's that, Dave? What are we doing? What are we looking at? It disappeared. Dave? I'm all by my lonesome. Sorry about that. I, when it's just your camera, I've got my kids in the background, and so I had my microphone muted. I'm pulling up the next questions, and I accidentally hit the I accidentally hit the button to share my screen instead of switch my screen. So you're good. Keep going. Okay. I I thought maybe I hit a button. I, I'm bad about touching buttons, you know, Dave. So yeah. So so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, there's uh, uh, it, it's going to be pretty easy things to talk about. You don't need a lot of space. You just need a small area. And you always hear me talk about less than 10 feet. In a 10 foot circle, you can teach your mule to side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters. You can teach the mule to pick up your feet. A lot of little things that I'm gonna talk about that's gonna help you out. Very good. Next question we got that come in. Uh, we had somebody messaging in that they're using your saddle and your saddle pad, but they're talking about the back heating up, it's it's burning the back of the mule. And so I wanted to know, Steve, what are your thoughts here? Now, of course, we want to know exactly what burning the back of the mule means, but what I was thinking is this is a great teachable moment to talk about um, just how you can, you can get all the right saddle, you can get the right saddle, the right tack, the right pad, and all this, all this stuff, but there are still going to be some adjustments that you need to make, and there are still going to be some things that you need to do in order to make sure that your mule doesn't overheat and the mule gets the benefit of uh, of what it is you've invested in. Of course, donkeys as well. So what, what do you have to say there, Steve? Okay, so Dave, here's one thing that people don't do. They don't spend the time when they take a break, whether they take a potty break or they take a break to get something to drink or something, Give the mule, give the donkey a break, okay? And that's really, really important that you give them a break. And how do I do that? What I do is I, I loosen up my cinches. I pull the britching up and over top of the saddle. I take my cinches, put up over top of the saddle. I pick up the back of the saddle and I shake it up and down and I allow cool air to go through. You see, the bottom of my pads are perforated nail cream. In other words, 
they allow air to flow. That's not like with wool pads. Wool pads hold in the heat and create the heat. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I don't know too many of you that wear wool during the summertime. Uh, yeah. Now, in wintertime, yeah, it'll keep warm. Yeah. So let's go back. I have actually put a thermometer underneath my pad and seen what the temperature was. And then I put a wool pad down and see what the temperature was. And I was always 10 to, to uh, 15 degrees cooler than all the other pads. A lot to do with the uh, flow of the air. But again, folks, I bet many of you don't do this. I bet many of you don't loosen up the cinches, pull the uh, breaching up, pull the back of the saddle up and down and shake it and cool off a little bit. Let some cool air go through there. Because you've got to remember, white spots that you see on your mules, when you see white spots, it is, it is overheating. It, and that's not the saddle's fault. It is your fault because you didn't take the time to cool off the back. It's called a scald, and it happens, okay? Now, where don't we want to see bright white spots? Up on the scapula. Seeing them in behind the back, there's fat pockets, and it's really easy, really easy to, to scald a fat pocket. Again, it's not the saddle's fault. It's because of the conformation of your mule or your donkey, and it's a high spot, and that high spot is there, and your saddle's going to rub at it no matter what. You can make all the custom pads in the world. What you have to do is get on a good feeding program, a good exercise program for your mule or your donkey. Donkeys are real bad for it, and the mules get it from the donkey, and exercise them. It'll get rid of the fat and keep them off of the smorgasbord. What's a smorgasbord? Put them out on pasture and turn them loose. You put them out in the pasture and turn them loose, it's like you and I getting on a smorgasbord and eating and keep trying. You got to try one of everything so we get our money's worth, right? Yeah, I know. I can show you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's go on. So heating up is a norm, okay? Uh, especially when you have hot, sultry days, you're back east where you have high humidity. I've, I've been back there. Golly. You know, it'll be 90 degrees with 80% humidity. Yeah, it's going to scald. Bring the back of the back, the saddle up and down. I have actually seen the full bar of the mule's back all in white across there because people over scalded, over rode their mule. It happens. Listen, these mules are not above getting and having uh, problems, okay? White spots, it's a norm. When it's, when it's a bad spot, it's running it's right up on the scapula. That's not a norm. That's using a horse saddle, banging on. Seeing a little salt and pepper in places, perfect. I've had people tell me they started using my pads after the wool pad, after they used wool pad all the years, and the scalding actually started disappearing. Why is that? Because what you want in a pad is this. You want to create sweat, which then creates what? Lubrication. What else does it create? It creates coolness. So that's the reason I developed my pad. And, 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 I'm, and by the way, with her, Davis, we, you and I talked earlier. Everybody, I like to see pictures of your mule's back. Now, I've never heard of, if I never had anybody tell me, or no, I've ever heard it myself, but somebody saying, the back overheated. Is it hot? Oh yeah. You can't pull a saddle off without without it feeling the heat from the body. You know. After all, you're sitting in it, and the saddle's sitting in it. So let's just say we got 200 pounds. It's got to heat. It's got to warm up. It's kind of part, especially when it's 110 degrees outside. So send me pictures saddled. Send me pictures unsaddled. And we'll take a look see. And then call me. Let's talk. It's amazing what we can do through the internet here. Uh, yeah. Next question. This one come in from David. He said, we bought a trail light Steve Edwards saddle and a saddle pad. I've been riding a semi-quarter horse bear trap. Mule turns to the left and seems to want to nip at my leg. What is he telling me? What would you say here to David? 
Okay, so he's got another saddle that he's used before this called the bear trap, and that's an old saddle that kind of comes around with the pommel. Now, is it, was he doing this before my saddle or since my saddle? We got to know about that. Now, also check, are you riding in a breeching or are you riding in a crouper? Is your back cinch tight? Okay, because here's what can be happening. And it happens a lot with mules, okay? You got the saddle too far forward. The rear cinch is not tight. The breeching is not adjusted correctly. And so what happens is when the mule is moving, it only takes just a few minutes, folks. I had a, I was talking to a lady the other day, uh, Dave, and she thought, well, I'm just going to jump on my mule and go just take a nice little ride. No breaching. No breaching at all. She ended up with a life flight out helicopter ride because the saddle went forward without a breaching. She did. She admitted she didn't tighten up the rear cinch. And she says, all my fault for trying to hurry. Folks, keep your britching on the mule all the time on the saddle. Flat ground or not, you have to have a breaching because the, the way mules are built. Now, Dave, I was also talking to Lane. Uh, a very good customer up in uh, Oregon. He has my pack saddles. He has my riding saddles, all of my equipment, and he's changing everything over. He said, I can't believe it, Steve. He says, when I go on the internet, I see people with, with mules and the saddle is sitting right on top of the scapula. And then I go and look through some of these mule magazines, and where do I see the saddle? Sitting on top of the scapula. And what else do I not see? A breaching. Listen, folks. These are horse people getting in the mule business because the mules now are hot. Yeah, they're worth a lot of money. And people are wanting gated mules, waste of time. People are wanting mules because they're thinking, oh boy, you know. And like Lane said, every one of them saddles are sitting on the scapula. They're not working with the mule and they do not know about the mule's bone structure. You've got to understand that. It's really important. They get their bone structure from the donkey. They are V-shaped in their shoulders. Horses are A-shaped in their shoulders. And that's why the saddle goes forward on a mule, goes backwards on a horse. Okay, that's the way it is. So with, with the way the mule is built, because he has the bone structure of the donkey, and also I've got to tell you too, the mules carry their weight down low. Horses carry their weight up high. Look at them. A lot of our mules look like they're pregnant it's because of the confirmation. So along, so you you were talking about the A frame uh, versus the V frame. This is a this is a great question to follow up there. I think Laura sent in a message says, "Is it possible to have any of your saddles made with a square skirt with rounded corners?" So talk to us about why the skirting is the way that it is and why the squared skirting is not ideal for a mule or a donkey. Okay, so we have to remember that donkeys move very laterally. Single foot, it's called, and the majority of mules inherit that nice walk. Now, when it is a square skirted saddle, it's going to inhibit the shoulder and the hip. That's why you see my saddles are rounded in the back, are rounded in the front, in the scapula, rounded in the back away from the hip bone. All of those are designed not to interfere with the mule, okay? Squared pad will interfere with the mule. Square skirting on the saddle will interfere with the mule. So I designed the mules, the, the skirting in such a way so that it does not interfere with those two hips and, and scapula. And the other thing is, I, and it's a sad story. I, and I, unfortunately, unfortunately, people care more about their wallet than they do being honest. And it happens with a lot of people that are, quote, selling mules. This nice four-year-old mule with one of our mule riders up in Utah has got a big hematoma on the back of his back right where that rump comes down and the skirting comes up and that hematoma 
is the saddle is rubbing on it, not my saddle, but a horse saddle, and those webbings uh, where the two skirts come together, okay? Then right in here, it's, it's laced together. That lacing rubs on that spine, creating a fistula, and now the mule is basically crippled. He's got, it, when he tries to pick up his back leg, he'll go and it'll, it'll drop. And he's, unfortunately, he bought a, a four-year-old mule from uh, an auction that nobody, of course, here's the deal, folks. Remember this? Ask me no questions. I tell you no lies. Unfortunately, it's kind of your fault, some, for not asking questions. And it's definitely deceiving and low integrity for people not to tell other people that the mule's got some physical problems. So there we are, Dave. Very good. So this is a great follow-up question to that one. Um, I've got a message here from Elizabeth. Elizabeth says, Steve, can you recommend reputable sources as to where to purchase my first riding mule? I'd be happy to pay for a consult of your time. I love your podcast and appreciate your educating people on mules. So first, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Really appreciate that. Thank you for taking the time to message in. Second, no payment needed. We'll give you some consult right here. And third, we don't actually have specific sources that we will recommend, and there's a very good reason why. The reason why is because we don't know the mule. And so you may have a, a great source or a great person, but we don't know that mule. And we can't tell you if that mule has a foundation or not. Now, Steve, if Elizabeth is going to go out there, what are a few things that maybe she could look for so she could be an educated buyer or a few questions, maybe if she's on the phone with a seller, that she could ask the seller um, in order to determine whether a visit out to see this mule in action is worth it? Okay, so number one thing, if you can't smell it and you can't touch it, you can't buy it. But Steve, the mule is in Florida, I'm in Oregon. Yeah, if you can't smell it and you can't touch it, don't buy it. Because listen, I'll tell you another little story. And I got thousands of these stories. I should write a book, Dave, um, on uh, the, uh, the woe is me of a mule purchaser, you know. So here, that Butch has a friend who bought a mule that was supposed to pack hundreds of miles, packed all kinds of stuff. And so this mule uh, uh, was, he was doing some things with him in a round pen and the mule spun and kicked him and broke his hand. Yep, you hear that folks? He said, I brought him home. I had him sent to me actually. Going by what this trainer told me, I mean, not this trainer, but this seller told me. And folks, just because they've packed a thousand miles, just because you see a picture, and, and, and these, these traders do this all the time, they'll put some little kid, without a helmet, by the way, they'll put some little kid on the back and everybody thinks, oh, wow, look, a little kid on that mule, it must be well-trained. No, 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 you know. Unfortunately, there are a lot of scrupulous people that know your thinking and they will use that to let you think it's well-trained. In a 10-foot circle, if this mule is well-trained, he's not crossing water, he's not going down roads that have a lot of traffic, he's not climbing the side of a mountain, he's not packing out an elk, but in a 10-foot circle, if the mule can side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters, and back up in a 10 foot circle, the mule has a pretty fair foundation. In a 10 foot circle, if you can pick up all four feet, have the mule stand still and quiet, saddling, brushing, and things like this, you, you've got a mule with a pretty good foundation. In a 10 foot circle, if you can take and saddle up and climb in the saddle, and the mule stands there nice and quiet, you've got a mule with a pretty good foundation. Okay, now here's the thing, folks. I, 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 yeah, I know lots of people who sell mules, but I'm going to tell you, there might be 2% of them that's going to be honest with you. And it's unfortunate. It really is. I, I, I really get saddened 
And it's on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, where people have called me that have bought a meal from so-and-so, so-and-so, and and he's supposed to be a really good meal. And they say, well, if you don't like the meal, you know, well, I'll get you another one. And they use that. They use that stuff like that all the time. Well, wait a minute. You're in Oregon. They're in Florida. That's a lot of money passing back and forth. And guess who has to pay for the shipping? You. Not the person who's selling you the meal. They just simply said, we'll find you a meal. They didn't finish the conversation. The conversation said, hey, I found you a meal. Get him sent to you. Not cost you another $2,000. So you see, it doesn't work, folks. These traders know how to say things. These traders know how to do things to make the meal look good. Okay? That's what they do. So now, let's go back. I'm not going to blame the trader. I'm not going to completely blame the meal. I'm blaming you. Because you do not have the education to ask the right questions. Now, you all know, okay, that if you don't ask the right questions, you may not get the right answer. Now, with Dave, he is a computer whiz. Man, I mean, last week when I was up hunting, he come up with a show right now. Boom. Instant show. That's my day. Okay. That's my stepson right there, so to speak, you know. And he instantly come up with a show. He couldn't get me. I was trying to talk to him, but he knew what to do. He was educated. With me, I'd go, oh, turn that thing off. I'm done with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's go back. Educate yourself. All right. That's why I got Dave. He's doing things that I couldn't begin to do. And I've known him since high school. All right. And so he, I've seen, I've watched him grow. So let's go back. Now it's you. Now, at my clinics, at my clinics, I used to bring a really well, had a good foundation meal with me. And I would go on all over the nation hauling these meals. And I would get on the meal in a 10 foot circle, side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters. You know, it all looked pretty decent. Jumped the meal in the trailer, picked up all four feet, saddled him with him standing still and quiet, not tied to nothing. So the mule looked pretty good. I tell the audience, okay, who in here has been riding for 25 years? Somebody pop up, somebody pop up. Okay, you come on down here, climb on this mule. Now, everybody just saw that mule do everything just right. Everybody. This person climbed on that mule. And 15 minutes later, it looked like that mule didn't have an ounce of training. Hmm. Wait a minute. We just saw the mule do everything with me. And everything was just right. So why is it the mule's fault? It's not. It's the person in the saddle's fault. Or the person that has the lead rope's fault. Okay. So let's go back to this. Education. Okay. Don't go listen to some trader that says, man, this meal has been there, done that. No such thing. This meal is child proof. No such thing. This, this meal is grandkid proof. No such thing. This meal is going to be as good as you are. That's what you got to think about. So why don't I send people here and there? Because I haven't seen you ride. Okay. I, I tell folks all the time. I don't call them a cowboy until I see them put their hand on the horn. Hand on the horn? What do you mean? Well, watch the old westerns. Remember, Dave, the old westerns? Remember those? Okay. Dave's got a story to tell us about that. Okay, watch the old westerns. Watch them. Watch Grit. That's my favorite one. How many of you watch Grit? Fire it up. Let me see you. Who's wears watches Grit? Do you see them grab the back of the saddle and the horn to get on? Nope. Do you see them grab the horn and the mane to get on? Yes. Do you see them get on from the shoulder? Yes. Why is that? Because those old bronc horses back then, they used to jump and kick at you, jump away from you, everything. Yes. So in the center pivot point, center pivot point at the shoulder is the safest place you can be. And you see in the westerns, the old westerns, you know, you watch every one of them cowboys on a rare time, somebody grabs the back of that saddle. You just don't really see it. 
So there you are, Dave. <laughs> so uh, I found this service. It's a service called Tubi, T-U-B-I dot com. And it's got all sorts of, it's like legal, it's legal, it's, it's, it's a, a mainstream streaming platform. And they've got a channel on there. It's called Grit Extra. So it's like the, it's like Grit, but it's their second channel. And it's free. You can go to Tubi.com and, uh, and watch Grit Extra for free. So I'm scrolling through and I tell Sandra, my wife, I've got three little boys, eight, five, or 10, eight, and five. And I said, oh, Sandra, this is that channel Steve is always telling me about. She goes, what is it? I said, it's Grit. We're always talking about this show uh, during the weekly live stream. And so, I, <laughs> and so I turn it on, and I've got 10, 8, and 5 sitting right next to me. And it's this man getting ready to cauterize his own wound, moaning with his shirt off, a <laughs> fire, and a knife. And she walks in right during this scene, and she goes, Steve told you to watch this? I said, no, it's just a channel. It's like, this is just the scene. It's, it's not like this. There's like, there's horses and like mules and things like that. She goes, oh, turn it, Dave, we've got kids here. Turn it off. So that was my first experience with grit. Oh. <laughs> I will say, I will say, I, I just went there right now just to make sure it was Tubi that it's on and I wasn't getting confused with something else. And it is, and the clip that it was just showing right now, as I confirmed, it was a, a man having a wonderful conversation with his two grandchildren. So that would have been a better first clip to have appeared on my uh, initial grit watching. But I digress. Jess just loves grit. What's Jess, that? Jess, my dog. My oh. Puppy, my four-year-old border collie. Man, what, Jess, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. See, so, so Comes alive. That, okay, good boy. As soon as I say grit, he's man, he's ready to watch him. Jess is there. the cow. There's cows there. and, and horses. Yeah. And we're gonna go watch grit. You want? He's looking at the TV, going. Okay, Jess, you're he's walking over there. Yeah, looking at me. Are you gonna follow me? Or turn grit on for me? I mean, I wish I could. I wish you could see it. He's got his tail up in the air. He's looking at me. He's looking at the TV. Because I got that dog TV. knows quality entertainment. Right. That do that dog can pick out quality entertainment in better fashion than the majority of the people on this earth. I don't know if I can get him in there. Or not. There he is, right there, Jess. Hey, Jess, yeah. Jess. Hey, Jess. There he is, right there. What a dog. Hey, real quick, I want to say hello to Barbara watching from Antigua. 80 degrees, no mules, but lots of, lots of donkeys. Linda, the mule servant, and Theo, the sweet one-eyed mule in cool, sunny, rural central Ohio. We have moved over to YouTube. Facebook keeps locking up every few uh, seconds. Yep, it that happens sometimes. With uh, it's, it, I'm grateful that we're on both because if one is having you know shenanigans, the other one tends to be doing okay. Hey, we've got Trace coming to us from Queensland, Australia. You know what that means? We've gone international. Get that glockenspiel out. Good to have you here. Roger is watching from Milan, New York, where it's 52 degrees. Alexa is watching from North Dakota and is a new mule owner. So, there we go. She says, your info is awesome, and I really appreciate the live streams. Thank you. Alexa, you're very welcome. And just so you know, all of these live streams, they're all available on YouTube. And there's well over 100 episodes now. You can go back and you can watch. And then if you'd like to listen, you can search on whatever podcast platform you use. You can search for um, Queen Valley Mule Ranch, and you'll see it come up. It's, it's the same program, just without the video. And so it's a little bit easier to, to listen to in the car or you know, if you're doing a ride and you want to listen or if you're out, you know, in the combine doing something like that. So uh, let's see here. David O'Brien, East Texas, 80 degrees and sunny. Good to have you here, David. Laura is watching, says hi, y'all. Linda says, I watch grit with the sound off so I can watch their hands and legs when they ride. There we go. Dave O'Brien says grit is great. Dave O'Brien also says love the old Western TV shows on grit extra. So Dave knows what exactly what I'm talking about here. Uh, Richard says, like Grit, WGT on that channel. No WGT on that channel. What does WGT mean? Hmm. What does WGT mean, uh, Richard? Tell me. 
Uh, and he's watching from East Texas. Myra is watching says, I see what you mean about riders on grit. Some of those guys are really good riders. So now let's let's hop over to this question. This one came in from Gia. Sending this message on Facebook says, I've never had a mule or a donkey, but I do know horses. What makes mules or donkeys different? I know they're very stubborn and smart, and they were bred, donkeys at least, for protection purposes. But that's it. I'd love to learn more. What would you say to Gia? No, they weren't bred for, for protecting animals. Uh, they weren't. Uh, that's what we use them for now. And I can tell you a lot of stories about that. But you know what? That donkey carried Jesus into uh, a particular town. And, uh, and he was a donkey colt, never been ridden before. So that shows you how good uh, cowboy Jesus was. He could ride a donkey colt with, uh, on bareback and no bridle. There you go. So let's go on back. Uh, never seen a stubborn mule. Never, ever. Stubborn donkey, never seen it. Unfortunately, people give them that thought. Now, let me tell you. I'll tell you a little story. I've been all over the world, right, Dave? Trained mules all kinds of places. So now, here we go. I'm in Pennsylvania, and I'm training. And so I always say to my students, hey, uh, tell me what I can help you with. And this lady come up and she says, this mule is stubborn, just like my husband. Okay. I'm not a marriage counselor, but tell me what's happened. So she climbed on her mule and she rode off and she went about 200 feet and the mule turned around and came right back. And she said, see that mule is stubborn, just like my husband. So I took her bridle off and I put my bridle on. I adjusted the stirrups and I rode off. I went past the place that she couldn't go to. I went up the hill. I went down the hill. Oh, don't go. Don't go down the hill. That mule will start running. And it didn't run. Uh, don't go toward that trailer. That mule doesn't like the trailer. I went everywhere. She said, you can't do it. And everybody's going, oh, wow, look. Steve trained this mule already. Already trained this mule. Oh. So I bring it back. And I say, OK, here's your mule. I pull my bridle off, put her bridle on, adjust her stirrups. She climbed on, y'all know it. The mule just went just a few feet, turned around and came back. She says, see that? Stubborn. And I said, no ma'am. What we have here is the failure to communicate. You were not using your legs and your hands correctly, and you did not have spurs on, and the mule just put you on ignore. So let's go back. Uh, they're extremely easy to ride. Uh, matter of fact, uh, you know, they rode him clear back in the biblical times. King David, uh, the first, the second king of, um, of, uh, uh, of the Israeli nation. Uh, there's a part in there where it says the king and his boys all climbed on their donkeys and rode off. Now, the older interpretations say asses, and they were called an ass, okay, and, and, uh, and, and rode off. So they've been ridden for years, okay. But now they're breeding him better because of better mules or, or horses, better quality of horse, and that way, and a better quality of donkey. Now we got better quality of mule. Okay, the mule is far exceeds the riding abilities of a horse. Now let's just give a challenge: take the horse to the Grand Canyon. Do they have horses at the Grand Canyon? No. Lots of reasons I'm not going to go into, okay? But they don't ride mule or horses at the Grand Canyon for a lot of reasons. So that's one thing. Now let's just try the, the mule against the horse, against the donkey, against the horse. Let's take a five-gallon bucket of grain and put it in front of the mule. Five-gallon bucket of grain and put it in front of the donkey. Five-gallon bucket of grain and put it in front of the horse. Horse will stick his nose in there. And when he's done eating his, he'll eat the mules, he'll eat the donkeys, and watch the mule and donkey. They'll eat a little bit. They'll go back and stand. They'll go over and get a drink of water. They'll eat a little bit, you know. Uh, and, and they won't founder themselves uh, out of stupidity. Now, can they founder? Yes, they can. Okay. All donkeys, all mules can get grass founder, can get heat, can get heat, heat founder and build up those fat pockets. Yes, they can. So what's the education? It's what you need. You need to have the education, and then you can follow up and say, okay, 
horse is this, mule is this. The, and we have a world champion mule days. Uh, our, we got mules that rope. We got mules that cut. We got mules that, that do raining patterns, a little bit of everything. Awesome. Uh, so I'm hopping back over here on Facebook. Actually, I've got a message here from Leslie. Leslie says, I bought the Martingale and my Molly, 11 year old, uh, green broke mule lets it slide through her mouth. She struggles turning left and fights it and it slides through her mouth. I have put on a bit guard and on a chin strap, none helped. She will turn right with no struggles. I have been working with her for a month now, riding three days a week. She does a little better with a hackamore. So we've got trouble going to the left, no trouble going to the right. Is that animal trying to tell us something? Okay, well, so let's look at the trouble going uh, to the left or right, whichever problem it is. Take a look at your saddle and make sure that the saddle is not going forward. And when she turns her head, uh, she bumps into the saddle. Now, that could be one reason. Now, I never, ever tell anybody on my Mule Riders Martingale to put a chin strap or to put any rubber stoppers. If you pull it through the mouth, guess what? Mm -hmm. Your fault. Your fault. Because you're over pulling. See, here's the problem, folks, especially with horsemen. They will bully the horse to make the turn. The mule won't do that. The mule does it in steps. He gets that from the donkey. Do it a few steps at a time. If you pull the bit through the mouth, you have over pulled and asked too much from your mule and for your donkey. Take off the chin strap, take off the guards, go back and work on your hands. It is not the bit, it is not the mule, it is your hands. Here's your hands, okay? And direction, impulsion. Not go like this. Don't do that. Here's the horn of your saddle. That's your horn. That's your gauge. Here's your pummel, 13 and a half inches on my saddle is anyway. Here's your horn. Your horn is your gauge. When I take my hands, and I go direction, impulsion. My left hand does not go past the horn. Okay? When I go to the left, direction, impulsion, my right hand does not go past the horn. And what you're doing is over pulling. Over pulling. Barely move your hands. That's how you build a foundation of a neck rein on a mule or donkey. Mules don't care about their mouth anyway. And when you over pull, you will teach them to brace and they will run through their shoulder. Again, here's your hands. Direction, impulsion. Where's my horn? Right here. My hand does not go past my horn. I'm barely moving my hands, folks. And listen, here's the other thing. When you move your body, you're moving your torso and you're moving your hip, okay? That's what you're doing, okay? That's what happens. And when you move your torso and your hip, guess what? You are now communicating with your hips and your legs and this sort of thing as well. And you don't want to do that. You do not want to use your legs and your reins at the same time when you're building a foundation for a neck rein. You want to only use a minimum of communication. When you use your legs as well as your hands, you're pushing them through. You'll see horsemen do it all the time, okay? Not a mule. Mule don't want to be pulled on, so barely use that. And if you got a question, call me. Hey, hello, remember I tell you all, call me. I'll help you. And right here, this is good for all of you. This is good for all of you. Barely move your hands. Next question. This one come in on Facebook from Hope. My new mule, uh, Weanling, was very accepting of human touch and attention on the day he was delivered. He led on, allowed ears and body touch, even picked up front feet well. He bonded quickly with two goats and was already acting differently by day two. We joke he thinks he's a goat. 
You could tell he felt safe with them. They welcome him, and now in a week, he's become the boss. He's five months old. We can still catch him, lead him before he stops, or lead him some before he stops. He kicked out a few times when near me. He's in a small lot with ability to go out and in and out of the stall. Am I getting too anxious since, since he is still so young? We go out and spend time with him daily. Hey, there's nothing wrong with going out daily and spending time with him. It is wrong when you have a corral bigger, especially for a five month old, bigger than uh, a 10 by 20. Okay, you don't need much room. Now, folks all the time are buying pasture buddies to be with their meal. You don't do that. Okay, I've got clients that cannot leave the corral with their meal unless the goat goes with them, unless the Shetland pony goes with them, unless a horse goes with them. Understand folks that you need to be the herd leader. You need to be their buddy. Now I can also tell you, I know some of you don't want to hear this, but I have seen those mules kill those goats. Yes, I've seen it do it. I've seen those mules kill calves. Okay. Why is that? Okay. Uh, because they're trying to be the herd leader and they're trying to move the goat a certain way or the sheep a certain way and they won't do it. So what do they do? If you're not moving, I'm going to bite you. That's what they do. They're an equine. Okay. If you're not moving, I'm going to kick you. I have known of people who have called me up and said, my mule just kicked my dog and he broke his leg. Yeah. Okay. It can happen. Okay. Have I trained my mules with my dogs? Yes. You know, my border collie, anytime we go out working cattle, Jess is right there with me. But I know where he's at and I tell him where to go. I don't just let him follow along and ride my little mule. No, no. I've got the, the, you need to take care of your dog as well as your mule. So as we go on, yes, he's five months old. All you should be able to, all you should do on a daily basis is pick up all four feet, touch him everywhere. Now you can use the lunch whip like I was telling you, but most of all, number one, don't use a nylon halter, don't use a chain, and don't use a rope halter. Rope halters, folks, do not build a foundation. What builds a foundation is my come along hitch. Use my ground communication kit, which is good for a, from a day they're, they're born until the day they die. That come along hitch is the most important communication tool that you have. So there you are. All right. I'm putting a link in the comment section for the ground foundation starting kit. Um, the two primary pieces that you're going to want in that kit, we don't really tell anybody to buy anything. Um, we've got a store filled of awesome stuff, but we never prescribe that, Hey, you can't do anything until you get this. However, we do emphasize that the ground foundation starting kit is something that everybody should have. Uh, the first thing that you're going to get is a training video. And so that's going to show you how to conduct foundation training uh, on the ground. Then the second thing you're going to get is your primary tool. This is the thing that uh, you're going to use over and over and over again. You're going to uh, rack, wax and re-wax. Uh, you're going to wax on. The wax will come off, so you'll wax on again. You're going to love this thing uh, because it it puts you in control in it and it helps you establish being the herd leader. And that's a great feeling. Because when you are the herd leader, you start to see the animal respond to you as oh, the yeah. leader, just as they would the lead mare. And that tool is the come along rope. And so you want that come along rope. You want to use that come along hitch. There's no better tool for working on your timing and working on how you communicate in the mule's language than the come along rope. And that's great for foundation. That's great for tune up. That's great for a, a you know. A three-year-old or a 30-year-old mule. So great, great tool. The third thing you're going to get for when you need it is a rope halter. There are a few instances where a rope halter is going to be necessary. The primary one that you'll hear us talking about is sur single training. That's where we're going to hook up the rope halter with some bale and twine and get a sur single on and we're going to teach the mule to level himself up. We're going to teach the mule to get his head down or his nose down on the vertical 
and that rope halter has the knots all in the right places to communicate exactly where the mule needs to hear it. So that's the ground foundation starting kit. If you don't have it, uh, you're, you're working harder than you have to. Uh, it really is an amazing tool. We've got two more questions and then that'll be it for today. Um, before we get to those, I want to say hello to Richard Matthews. says, good afternoon, Chaplain Steve and Chaplain Dave. Uh, and that is true. Steve and I are both uh, both licensed ministers. And so uh, if y'all need any weddings performed or whatnot, you know, we, we'd we be willing to fly out to Hawaii to perform a ceremony. Uh, we'll, we'll do a tag team too. I'll like tag Steve in and then he'll tag me in and uh, we'll have a mule. You can come down the aisle riding a donkey. Um, it'd be fun. Uh, Johnson, uh, taxidermy. Sherman Johnson is there. Norman, Oklahoma, 73 degrees. Uh, we've got Lamar says, hi, my mule friends. Oh, hi, my mule friends. 55 degrees. Windy and Price, Utah. My border collie loves grit also. Steve, a week ago, I got my cat got to cow camp late. The group had already headed out. So I jumped on my mule kitty out of the trailer and got on her and she was not leaving the campsite. I spurred my you I spurred used my reins over and under. She wouldn't go. I finally got off and led her out of camp a long way, got on. She went a little easier but didn't really want to go. What do you think was going on in her mind? So not only is Steve going to read a mule's mind he is going to read a female mule's mind right here. What do you say there, Steve? <laughs> well, okay, look. When you have a mule that says, I'm not going to move, most people use both legs at the same time. And also the over and under. Has the over and under work good? Yes, it does. Does it need to be used? Not that much. Use your spurs. Right, left, again, have a move a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, and use your spurs accordingly, right, left, right, left, and then go on, eventually go out. Now, when I do something like this, I'm going to use my Mule Riders Martingale because I know I have control. It's not unusual for a mule to say, I don't want to go out there. They're saying, out there, eat me. That mule understands that it's the lower part of the food chain and if there's another horse around or another mule around, yep, let's go. So this is going to be up to you, the herd leader, to say we're going to go out. Now, you may not go directly out the way they went, but you may go way off to the left and then curve back to the right. You may go way off to the right, curve back left. Eventually, you go out there. But use your legs right, left, right, left, not both at the same time. Right brain, listen to me. Left brain, listen to me. And every time you do that, put your hands down. Give them a direction to go. Because when your hands are up, you're holding them, say stop. Your legs are saying go. Your hands come up, stop. Your legs say go. So it needs to be your hands go down using your right hand, left hand, and get your border collie out in front, and the mule will follow that border collie. All right, final question of the day. This one comes from Dave O'Brien. When working my Molly Mule with the Sir Single, Britchen, and Halter, can you give me an idea of how loose the string from the Sir Single to the Halter should be? Should, should she not be able to touch the ground? Also, is it better to introduce the breast collar at this point? So while you start talking about that, Steve, I'm going to try and find a video here so we can look at it. Now, adding everything would work good, breaching the breast collar and all that stuff. You bet. Yes. The general rule of thumb is if they can get their head down to get a bite or get their head down to touch the ground, then it needs to be snugged up a little bit more. You want to have it so that it's just loose enough that as soon as the mule sticks his nose out, he's going to bump his nose. That's what you do with a mule. You train with the nose. Now, the one question that I didn't answer to the lady that says she does better with the hackamore, the downside of the of the hackamore, mechanical hackamore, is that you can make their nose real sore and they'll run off with you. You're had, you're done, okay? So don't use a mechanical hackamore to train with. Use a mecha ha mechanical hackamore when you can ride 80% off your legs and 20% off your hands and have that mule be fluent and soft. If you've got to use two hands, on a mechanical hackamore, you're going to have problems. There you go. 
There is a, a mule that we use. You can see the twine on it, and you can see the breeching on it. Can you use a breast collar on it too? Yes. At any time, you can apply them all. But usually what I do is put the mule in the round pin, and it doesn't make any difference where the breeching is. You can see the breeching is hanging real low. makes no difference. The idea of the breeching is this, and the idea of the surf single is this, that it's the, the, when the mule moves his head forward, he's going to bring the surf single forward. That's why the breeching has to be there to keep the surf single from going forward. The idea of the twine is, again, I'm not making the mule get his head down. Look at his nose coming on vertically. I'm not making him do that. The twine is light enough, but just the pressure from the halter only, the pressure from the halter only is what's getting this mule to drop his head and get his nose on the vertical. Is he looking at all kinds of things? Yeah, that's okay. Let him do it. You know, let him walk around. Notice I'm not pushing him. I'm not making him go. The mule is wanting to go. So I turn around out there. I kind of stop the mule. And the mule says, well, what am I supposed to be doing? And now I'm explaining about it. So there you are. It should be helpful to you. Awesome. Very good. All right. Linda just got in a question. We love Linda, so we're going to get it. We're going to get her question, even though I said it was the last one. We're going to get her question. Myra says, your explanation for reining finally makes sense to me. It has made the difference. Less is more. I still have much to improve on uh, for my communication. My mom already knows what I want to do. Dave says, thank you. Linda says, question regarding reining. In some of your videos, I do see the direction hand go far out to the side through the impulsion hand. Uh, though the impulsion hand does not go past the horn. Is that correctly done? If so, why does one move the direction hand straight out to the side? What does it do? What that does is simply puts a little pressure on the outside rein when your hands are out here, puts a little pressure on the outside rein to where the mule is being uncomfortable. And finally, when he moves, I get my hands back to center. See, we don't want to make them turn. We want to show them direction. So, when we, when we make our turn, the mule goes with his nose. That's enough. Go back to center. The mule then says, okay. When I, I'm going to say direction impulsion, the mule says immediately, goes with his nose. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You, you're not letting go of me. You, you let go of me before. How come you're not letting go of me? And then all of a sudden, the mule moves his shoulder. Then I go back to center. Now the mule knows I'm going to move my nose. I'm going to move my shoulder. And you're going to let go of me. It's a deal. So here's my third time. Direction, impulsion. So I'm waiting. Notice my horn. Okay. I'm waiting. And the mule's thinking, okay, I move my nose. I move my shoulder. You're going to let go of me, right? No. Well, this is not fair. What am I supposed to do? So finally, the mule moves a foot. I go back to the center. See? Now I've taught the mule, move your nose, move your shoulder, move your foot. I'm done today. I've gone to the right, and I want to do the same thing to the left. Nose, shoulder, foot. I'm done today. No more than that. You don't need to make them turn. You need to show them the direction. That's how you make a nice, light neck ring. Direction impulsion. The next day... Okay, five days later, you don't need to train every day. You don't want to train every day. You're going to make your meal sour. But the next time I climb on, I do the same thing. I do all three of them, direction impulsion to the right, direction impulsion to the left. I do it three times, and the meal does it right every time. Now, this time, now I add three more to it. Now I do six. Next time I train, a week later, three days later, I do nine. The week later, I do 12. You got the idea? Three, six, nine, 12. Not just to make them go, but you'll see they'll get lighter and lighter and lighter. Okay? And do not, with a snaffle bit, do not put a chain across it and don't put guards. Use your hands. If you pull the bit through their mouth, you are over pulling. You're asking too much of them. Okay? you got to remember, yes, they have two brains. Yes, they do. Brain on the right, 
brain on the left. They've got those brains. They don't have the cranial lobe going from right to left. They don't have that, okay? So therefore, the part that, that takes in the information you're giving them is not much bigger than a walnut, y'all. Not much bigger than a walnut. So therefore, you want to put as little information in there as possible, okay? Happy trails to you. Awesome. Everyone, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. If you just started hanging out with us, uh, there was a time change and it totally slipped my mind that Arizona does not, like we don't change our clocks all year long. And so uh, this morning I woke up and I had a couple meetings that happened uh, an hour later than what they were supposed to. So if you're joining us an hour later than what it was supposed to, uh, thanks so much for being here. You can go back and watch the replay. Um, Our times will be... uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Mountain, 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern. Those are the new times during the um, standard uh, time. When it goes to daylight savings time, everything uh, goes back an hour. So thank you so much for being here. We're very grateful to have you. You can go to muleranch.com, find more information, all sorts of free. That's right, free, our big F-bomb of the day. Free stuff to help you gain the trust of your animal, get results. Uh, You don't need to be frustrated. There is an easier way. And we want to help you. So be be sure to reach out if there's anything that we can do. Steve, we will... Uh, oh, and real quick, in the comment section right now, I'm dropping a link. At the end of this month, Steve and I are going to be hosting our next webinar. And this one is all about training without a saddle. We're going to be talking about working on your timing, how to make sure that you can continue to... Uh, continue to... Uh, Enjoy progress even when you're not out there riding uh, during the colder months of the year. Thank you so much. Y'all get that in the comments section. Sign up, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.